What's up, everyone? I'm Thomas J. Beleza, and welcome to another lesson on the right mindset. Today, we are going to go over, as you can see, the five don'ts of dialogue. Dialogue is the heartbeat of character interaction, serves as a powerful tool to bring your story to life. It's not just about what your characters say, but how they say it and what they choose not to say. Uh, ineffective dialogue can deflate the most gripping plot or render the most intriguing characters lifeless. Things we will go over in this lesson are the following. We'll explore how to avoid common pitfalls in writing dialogue uh, to ensure it serves your narrative, enriches your characters, and captivates your readers. So, as always, I will provide examples, because uh, that's what I do. Uh, we're going to just kind of keep it going. We're not going to do the intro today. So section one, the essence of dialogue and storytelling. Let's kind of go over this a little bit, shall we? All right. Boop. Okay. Just so you know, uh, the goal of this lesson really is that uh, not just to point out common mistakes, but to deepen your understanding of what effective dialogue can accomplish. It's about refining your skill to use dialogue as a versatile tool in your storytelling arsenal, enhancing every aspect of your narrative from character development to thematic depth. So before we actually jump into the five don'ts, let's understand that dialogue in literature isn't just a means of communication between characters. It's a dynamic vehicle for storytelling. See, masterful t dialogue reveals character personalities, drives the plot, and creates immersive world for the reader. But when misused, it can disrupt the narrative flow and disconnect the reader from the story. So our goal in this lesson is to understand the power of dialogue. We're going to learn how to avoid common mistakes and also how to harness the potential uh, in your storytelling through the dialogue. Now, dialogue is not merely a transcription of spoken words. It's a crafted narrative uh, that, well, it's, a, it's an element of the crafted narrative uh, that serves multiple functions. So understanding these functions is crucial for you as an author uh, when you're aiming to create compelling and believable characters. Uh, on the surface, just keep in mind that dialogue to speak is not as powerful as dialogue to say something and saying something is in the subtext. I'm sure you hear that often, uh, but it's also the words chosen from that character. The way the syntax moves through that, that dialogue is important for that character. So it's not always about the words you feel as an author, the, the reader needs to hear, but it's what, the perspective and purpose, the motivations of what is being said from a character. A quick example of that would ultimately be, uh, I think I've talked about this multiple times, but we create positions for characters. And if one position is that they like the Jets and the other position is uh, for another character is they like the Giants. Well, if somebody brings up the Jets being a bad team, the person who likes the Giants might say, I agree, whereas... The person who likes the Jets would be like, I disagree wholeheartedly. Now, how they go about their agreements and disagreements would be the character dynamics that you would create through dialogue. But their position would create their purpose. Now, obviously, a massive Jets fan who grew up in a Jets household uh, who's diehard Jets might not let somebody knocking the Jets go by. So if somebody's like, the Jets are the worst team, a diehard Jets fan might not just be like, oh, yeah, whatever, if that's what you feel. They might stand up for it, and that creates personality traits through dialogue. So choices are choices for a reason, because the characters have positions. But with that said, uh, seven things uh, you want your dialogue to help with is... Uh, as you can see on the scroll, revealing character, driving the plot, building the world, enhancing themes and subjects, and creating realism and relatability, as well as establishing pace and tone. And of course, you can offer different perspectives on positions. Mm -hmm. Now, the five following don'ts aren't important to avoid because they will keep... Uh, the five following don'ts are important to avoid because they will keep characters from being revealed, driving the plot forward and building the world, etc. The following five don'ts, uh, they basically stop narrative. But 
knowing what they are uh, gives you a chance to recognize them. Okay, so let's do it. Okay. The five don'ts of dialogue and their impact on story. Okay, so... Boop. Wait, what's going on here? Oh, okay, okay. One second. Boop, 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 doop, boop, boop, doop. Oh, yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah. Boom. Okay, info dumps. Number one, avoid using info uh, dumps through dialogue uh, is because, you know... If you're just like, I need people to know this, sometimes you want to break it up and let it spread out through a scene. Because effective dialogue should weave exposition organically, balancing between showing and telling, uh, and also overloading dialogue with information can overwhelm the reader and feel artificial. Dialogue should not uh, feel like a convenient contender for delivering large chunks of background information or exposition. When characters unnaturally spew out information for the sake of the reader, it breaks the immersion and disrupts the narrative flow. Instead, exposition should be woven into the story through more subtle means like actions, thoughts, and brief dialogue exchanges that feel organic to the situation. This approach maintains ow, the natural rhythm of conversation and keeps the reader engaged. Now, uh, a quick a quick verbal example of this is uh, we need to get to the planet blue 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 so we can find the temple of yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, otherwise the monster cuckoo coo is going to destroy the world and we have two weeks to do all this and stop the monster. That's straightforward exposition. Now, there's also subtextual exposition where, like, the planet is falling apart around them in the scene. And maybe the exposition is, if we stop the monster, this world will stop being destroyed. So showing the world being falling apart is a form of exposition through narrative uh, it's allowing the world itself to breathe the reality of the situation because exposition is, exposition is information that the character needs to know to basically connect the dots, right? So sometimes you kind of want to allow the audience to think on their own and see the uh, subtext uh, or contextual uh, exposition within the narrative. Now, taking my example where we have to go to a planet to get a MacGuffin to stop the antagonistic force is you could allow that information to spread over the course of moments. So maybe it's really they discover that they have to go to this planet because the thing they need is there, right? Or they discover that they need a thing in one moment, one chapter. And through that chapter, we learn more and more about that thing, the MacGuffin. And by the end of the chapter, they realize that they have to figure out where it is. So the next chapter or the next two chapters is them basically doing their work to discover where the location is. Now, all this is doing is spreading out the exposition and adding to the narrative. It's developing the story of your narrative. Now, plot is what needs to happen. Story is how it unfolds, right? So that's what makes up a narrative. Narrative is made up of story and plot, right? Um so always look at exposition as how can I spread this out and why do I need to say all of this right this moment? Is there a way I can allow the characters to discuss it and have alternate point of views? We, oh, it turns out we need this MacGuffin. Uh, I don't know if that's a good idea. Well, why don't you think it's a good idea? And then person three says, uh, well, because didn't that thing is you know, on a uh, so-and-so planet, or at least that's what they say. And that planet is we're humans. We can't go there. Oh, why can't we go there? Well, if we go there, we could die because they don't have air. Well, I think it's worth the risk to go. And now we're creating conflict through conversation and point of views. And you as the reader get to discover about the MacGuffin and maybe the location of the planet over this conversation that has 
point of views. You might have two people that agree with that. We have to go. You might have one or two people saying we can't, we shouldn't go. It's, it's pure death. You could have someone saying, well, uh, that's not true. I, I, I heard that uh, it's just myth that the planet is uh, inhabitable. I mean, how else did they get the MacGuffin there? Right. So like you start developing the exposition through these interesting dynamics. Okay. All right. Number two, unrealistic conversations. Strive for authenticity in dialogue. Real people seldom speak in perfect sentences or long monologues. Uh, incorporate natural speech patterns, including interruptions and informal language to add realism to your character's conversations. Authentic dialogue reflects how people speak in real life, which is often imperfect and spontaneous. Now, people interrupt each other. What? Uh, they interrupt each other all the time or sometimes, depending on who you're hanging out with. And their sentences usually trail off, you know, because I was kind of thinking about the other day when I oh, you see what I did. OK, uh, they use fillers uh, like, you know, and uh, and they react in nonverbal ways like. Yeah. OK. So crafting dialogue that mirrors these aspects of real speech adds depth and realism to your characters. Keep in mind, you are trying to do verbatim how we speak, because again, there's a lot of dialogue that leads to the action of conversation, but we don't necessarily need the, hey, how's it going? Pretty good. Uh, how was your morning? It was all right. Sometimes you could just get to the nitty gritty, like... I can't believe what uh, Mike did today at work. Oh, he's doing that thing still. Yeah, he, this is three days in a row, and I I tried talking to him about it, and he told me it's all in my head. Well, did you go to your board? And now we're in the dynamic of the conversation. We got right to the nitty gritty, right? But also think of it like we don't always emphasize the whole truth and nothing but the truth, but also we don't always, like they said, a full monologue. There's a difference between, I can't believe what Mike did today. He did the same thing he's been doing forever. You know, I even tried to speak with him. I tried talking to the boss and nothing came out of it. And I'm sitting here like, I don't want to go to work tomorrow. This is three days of aggravation. And then the other person goes, oh, well, what are you thinking of doing? Right? Like we lose the dynamic of that. So having the character come in and go, I'm, I, I don't know if I could go into work tomorrow. What happened today? It's just not even, I don't even want to talk about it. Can you believe what he did? I, Mike did it again. Okay, so uh, maybe you do want to talk about it. Yeah, sure. Uh, fine. What, no, I don't want to talk about it because how dare he bring that up? It's three days in a row. Well, did you, did you talk to him about it? I talked to him about it. Okay. He doesn't think I say things and he's just waiting for it to end. You know what I'm saying? Like you're creating a break and a rhythm and a jazz to it. Name dropping. Now, I said Mike a couple of times, but Mike is important exposition. It's uh, explaining. It's adding context, right? So there is a difference between constantly. Oh, this is number three name dropping. Constantly using characters names in dialogue feels unnatural and redundant. Trust your audience to follow who's speaking without excessive reminders. This makes for a more natural and engaging conversation. Because overusing characters' names and dialogue can feel forced and unnatural. In real conversation, people rarely use each other's names except for emphasis or to attract attention. Trust your readers to keep track of who is speaking, especially through character voice and dialogue tags. Now, I know that there are people out there that uh, will say, well, it's a it's an indicator, you know, it's a, it's a you know, but that's that's what to get someone's attention means, you know. If somebody, if, if it's a tick or if it's OCD or if it's autism or it's neurodivergent, whatever the case may be, it's still to get somebody's attention. So it's still, if that's how you write it and that's, you, you want to, you know, that's what you do. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying in that, in natural conversation, uh, we don't just say people's name for no purpose. We don't go, Mike, I need to talk to you about something. Okay, Mike. Uh, all right, Jim, what is it you want to talk about? Well, Mike, you know, the other day, uh, listen, Mike, I don't know if I want to talk about it. Like, we don't naturally do that when we talk to each other because we are seeing one another. So we already know. But if we want to get their attention, we might be like, 
Mike, I don't, will you just listen to me for a second, you know, or will you just listen to me, Mike, just for a moment, like have the name placement have uh, some sort of value to it. It doesn't have to be profound value, but it can be valued, meaning you're getting someone's attention or you're trying to emphasize something. Uh, if you look through your dialogue and you see that the names are being used often and you're doing dialogue tags with, you know, Mike said, uh, you might want to clean that up however you know it is your story you could do whatever you want and you can't change the writing process without uh, taking chances right so you never know you might people might be like this is the best use of overusing names i've ever seen all right number four ignoring the setting the setting influences dialogue. Characters should speak differently in varied environments and situations. Dialogue in a formal setting will differ in tone and formality from a casual one, reflecting the context in which it occurs. The setting and context should influence how characters interact. Characters will speak differently at a formal business meeting compared to a casual encounter at a coffee shop. Consider factors like social context, historical period, relationship value ge and geographical locations and shaping your dialogue. So I have a scene. Well, all right. In the novel, the, ep the epic fantasy novel I'm working on right now um, in the, in the, in the village, uh, the, the main character and the tribe speak like they do. They have, uh, they're philosophical. Um, their, uh, their communication is all, it's all about communicating uh, they communicate coherently. Uh, they express themselves. It's 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 supported and uh, encouraged to speak your mind. And if there is there's a there's a scene in uh, chapter two, chapter two, maybe chapter four, where uh, characters end up fighting one another. The pro, you know, the, the, but they're both on the protagonist side, uh, and somebody in the group sits them down and says no you're working this out talk it out does we can't let this linger you, you know based on i don't want to give anything away but they're basically like you can't just let this live in you you have to talk about it you, you at least start the conversation if, if it doesn't finish today great but at least feel get it out let it known so that's in the village right with the tribe um, but because this persecution, uh, and by the way, they're both the same people, like they're called Hamarians. I don't have humans or anything. I have, they're just a different species, but they're called Hamarians. And there's like the Hamarians that stayed to their traditions, uh, and they like worship the gods and, uh, you know, they believe in, they don't believe in money per se, but they believe in, you know, being free and on the, and living off the land. But then there's Hamarians that like move to the cities and the village and, and the towns and they, you know, live within the systems and they, 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 they uh, deal with money and they, they don't really live off the, the, you know, the, the land anymore. But more importantly, some, if not most, uh, kind of abandon their, the old gods, you know, so, but they had the same people. They all come from tra every Hamarian comes from or is directly descendant of some sort of tribe and uh that's like an important element to the to the narrative too like they they always kind of like try to figure out what what where where are you uh descended from anyway so those protagonists how they're open and philosophical in in the village when they go to the city they actually become more reserved because there's a little bit more oppression in the city and they know that they just they're in the city to get what they have to and they just want to get home. So they don't really speak up as much. They just they just want to get through the conversation, meaning like if they go to the gate and they're like, why are you here? And they're like, I'm here for two days. I just need to get some supplies and I'll be gone by night. OK, you know, but they're not going to sit and have a conversation with them if they deal with if they don't want to deal with being in trouble and someone is uh, a little derogatory to them, they just. They just hold their tongue and they just whatever. And they go, because in their mind, they're like, this isn't our home. We don't care about it. We're the ones that are free. These people live inside walls. They're prisoners. They're the ones. And it's interesting because in their mind, they're thinking that the city folk, which is true in their perspective, they're, they're looking at the city folk like, I don't need 
to alter your behavior because you've already fallen and I can't control your uh, your change back to the old ways. I I'm OK with you being here because it doesn't influence me because th- they really are completely separated. Like they try not to bother each other. They're like, you do your thing. I'll do my thing. But sometimes the village, be, you know, the tribes have to go into the city sometimes. Um, but that changes the dialogue and the behavior because of the environment. Um, the other thing is what if uh, the way two characters uh, might interact is a lot different than how that ca- those characters will interact in a group. A good example of that is if you're in a relationship with somebody, privately, you behave and communicate differently than, say, if you're out in public around other people. So think about those things. That's part of the environment. Number five, forgetting subtext. All right. Uh, subtext enriches a dialogue, revealing layers beneath the spoken words. Characters often have hidden motivations and emotions. Convey these through what is left unsaid, body language and tone, adding depth and intrigue to the conversation. Now, remember that subtext, which is what's unsaid but implied, is a powerful tool in dialogue. It adds layers of meaning and emotion beneath the surface conversation. Characters might hear hide their true feelings or intentions, creating tension and intrigue. Um, look at what needs to be said. Or conveyed, I should say, what needs to be conveyed, and think about how you can portray those words, uh, or that uh, that uh, yeah, how to portray those words through action and or sentences that don't or dialogue that don't necessarily say exactly what they feel. There's a difference between going, "I am so angry at you right now," versus the conversation is like somebody walks in. The person they're angry at and they're like um are you meeting us up are you meeting us for dinner later uh me and me and the others it depends what does it depend on i don't know i might be busy i don't know if i can do it well they need you there they want you there oh they well i'm glad they want me there well i want you there too are you sure you want me there yeah i'm sure i want you there hmm. well i'll think about it like that is, ang- you know, like there's there's subtext to that. There just just is, you know, because one character is not saying what they feel, but they are feeling <laughs> what they're trying to say through their dialogue, you know. And uh, oh yeah, uh, bonus tip: remember, dialogue is action. It can reveal character dynamics, move the plot forward, and create dynamic tension. So use it strategically. Now, what that means is dialogue is action is it should have relevance to the rule of one or more elements in every sentence. So that rule where one or more of these elements should be placed in every sentence of plot, character development, or world building. <clears throat> the behavior of a character is character development. What they choose to say or choose to or not to say is character development. The words and ideas that come out of their mouth, the things they pay attention to, the things they notice in people, their empathy, their, their apathy, all character development, which happens through dialogue. Now, if dialogue on page is just, it's really nice out today. The sky is blue. And you're like, okay. Um, And then the next sentence from the other character is like, so I heard back from uh, the court today about uh, the foreclosure on the house. Oh, well, tell me more about that. Like that first line of it's really beautiful out today doesn't necessarily do one of those three things. Unless, of course, you make it so the character is making a choice to deflect or they're paying attention to something like, now you have to add some context to that. So let's say the character is looking out the window. Uh, they have a cup of coffee or tea in their hand. Uh, they're just in in the narrative. They're looking at certain things. They're watching kids play across the street. Uh, you know, the, 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 they see the postman, uh, post person, uh, the mail, the mail person uh, going around, putting some mail into the, the, the mailboxes, et cetera, et cetera. And then someone. Uh, 
uh, and then just like, wow, it's really beautiful today. Right. Or, or you could have the other person come in and be like, uh, we need to talk. It's, and then their, their response is, it's so beautiful out today. And then the other person goes, I, I got the judgment back from, from the courts uh, about the foreclosure. And then that changes, right? <clears throat> so now that moment has character development in it because of what they're paying attention to. Okay. Before we go any further, as always, if you're a beginner or an advanced writer uh, or screenwriter and you like what you've seen up to this point uh, or you've been enjoying the other videos and you just haven't done it already, could you please subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss out? We on the Right Mindset channel, talk about lessons on craft, as per se. Uh, uh, we do analyzing and reviewing of story and narrative, and we also do interviews with fellow authors. All right, going on to section three, examples of each don't. Mm. All right, give me a moment. We're going to put this on screen. We're going to make you happy. We're going to make you happy. I'm only going to do uh, one example uh, so we could focus on it, okay? So the first example, uh, the first, uh, well, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do, obviously you'll see, I'm, I'll do three, I'll do three. All right, uh, information dumps. <clears throat> All right, so the example is, can you believe that this desert is 500 years old? Us being here is going to change it all with the, terraforming technology a crew of 200 uh have brought across the galaxy i know we miss earth but in the next 30 days we'll have started the process of making this our new earth a place where people can travel to with their families and make a home here themselves you know with our original earth dying from all the pollution and war from several generations back okay now clearly <laughs> That's a lot of information. That's a monologue and that's an info dump. So a stronger way to unfold this information is through character plot, uh, character and plot, right? So let their actions and the world around them unfold. Uh, for example, maybe have the characters unsure about the age of the desert. They do some tests and it comes out that it's 500 years, right? So, um, let me uh let me come on screen. What's going on here? Hey. 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 Is this it? I think that's it. Boop. Let's do that one. Is that? No, that's not the one I want. Whatever. Okay. Anyway. Hey, uh, what I'm talking about. So do so. The example I said is instead of them saying that it's 500 years old or whatever it is, uh, yeah, it's 500 years old. Uh, do a test, right? And what this means is, um, what this means is, have the characters moving around the environment so we could see that it is a desert. Okay, describe the way they're walking through it. How bleak is the weather? Is it really hot right now? Is it blazing? Is the sun going on? Right. Um, you could even have somebody say, well, just sweating and like wiping the sweat and like covering their head up. And like, they're just like, I can't believe three days of the sun. Like, these are the slowest days. <laughs> these are some slow ass days. Right. And and then the other person might be like, they'll, they'll be like, well, before you know it, we'll be we'll be moving forward what we need to be moving forward with. As they're like leaning down and they finally get to a location and they're checking the dirt, they put it into a thing and they put it into the uh, the device. And while it's like, you know, right, while it's doing that in the story, the novel, whatever, uh, the narrative, the two characters can continue talking and be like, I'm so hungry. I, you know, <laughs> I, I would rather be back on the ship uh, eating right now than doing this. Uh, so I, I know what you're feeling. Like, I get it. You're hot. I, I'm 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 tired. I'm hungry. I'm also hot. But you know why we're here. And then the person goes, I do. I understand. But, you know, uh, this this is only the second planet we've ever even tried um, to terraform. You know, and uh, the first one didn't go as as planned as we thought. And then you hear, bing, bing, you know, because the machine, the machine is ready and they go, 
and then the other person turns around and they're like, yeah, well, you know, they, they, that's why, uh, we continue to work and try to advance the process, but we have to try. Right. And then they look at it and go, Oh, turn, turns out this desert has been like this for 500 years. There's, there was a form there, there shows, uh, elements or, or minerals that, uh, there was once, uh, life and water on this planet. So that's a good sign that that's important for us. Right. Like I, I know I, I'm just making it up on the spot. So I, I obviously I'm stuttering and I'm trying to get through the thoughts and I'm doing it in the real time, but ultimately we're learning a lot and we're seeing the characters perspectives and positions, you know, like the hungry one, the tired one, uh, who knows what, the information that one person is saying is different than the information the other person is saying because one seems aware, one seems more knowledgeable, right? So we're learning about the world through this nice fluid dialogue instead of it just being like, you know? All right, let's do another one. Let's do another one. Unrealistic dialogue. Yeah, let me do this so we could see the dialogue a little clearer. Okay. Unrealistic conversation. <clears throat> I am not sure you understand how mad you have made me about crashing my car. I know you are mad at me. I am sorry. Please forgive me. No, I cannot forgive you. This is the last straw. All right. I'm going to leave uh, the screen up a little bit just so you can see. So the way I would look at it is uh, right away. Uh, I'm not sure you understand what's going on. Uh, right. You don't, you don't talk or you don't say, or, uh, you suck. So good communication, or you could even go like, "How am I ever supposed to know what's going on with you, Mister?" Keeps everything inside. Okay, um, you want me? To uh, it would it'd make it a lot easy easier, I tell you. All right. You crashed You crashed my car and you want me to explain why I'm mad at you mad whoops uh i know all right i know you're mad about that but i've said i'm sorry how many times right now we're adding we're creating character <laughs> clearly not enough Sorry, would be in the form of ca form of cash in my hand for the, the damn damages for the damn damages. Okay, so there you go. All right, let's get that back up there. Bam, the barrel. Let's do it again. I'm not sure you understand what's going on right now with me. How am I ever supposed to know what's going on with you? Mr. Keeps everything inside. You want me to tell you what's going on? Uh, it'll make it a lot easier, I tell you. You crashed my car, and you want me to explain why I'm mad at you. I know you're mad about that, but I've said, but I've said I'm sorry how many times? Clearly not enough. Sorry would be in the form of cash in my hand for the damn damages. We just turned that other scene into a more dynamic scene. Uh, just by adding some movement, we took those three sentences, we cut them up a little bit, and we added some subtext without being direct. We didn't learn that they crashed the car right away, uh, right? So 
you know, again, if we go, if we go, if we go back real quick, uh, I'm not sure you understand what's going on right now with me. So right now it's like, oh, there's intrigue because it's like, well, what is going like me as the reader? What is going on with? We don't know if they're mad. We don't know what their deal is. And then this person is explaining their perception of the person. How am I ever supposed to know what's going on with you? Just to keeps everything inside, right? Uh, I would probably rework that sentence a few times, <laughs> but just for the sake of this, uh, we're, we're being, that's character development. We're learning uh, through exposition, uh, um, narrative exposition, what's going on with the character, right? And then they're like, they're hesitant on saying, I don't, I don't know if I want to tell you, right? Which is adding to the energy of they are mad and angry at them. And then they're just like, I, you know, uh, it'd make it a lot easier, I tell you, right? And then like, you crashed my car. So now we know it took, it took five sentences to learn what, what the argument is about, right? Uh, you crashed my car and you want me to explain why I'm mad at you, right? Or uh, explain to you why. Oh, yeah. It's a, so now we know. We know what's going on, right? And we understand the frustration. The frustration's there because they, they couldn't just say it outright. They just, and they're confused. They're perplexed. They're like, how do you not even know why I'm I'm upset right now? Like, you're the one who crashed the car. And then we learn we learn that they do know. We, they do know, but they're, uh, you know, they're like, uh, how many more times can I say I'm sorry? And you realize, well, here's the solution, but it's still not enough. It won't be enough because no matter how many times you say you're sorry, it'll never be enough. Uh, but I, cash in hand would be good though. That, that'll help with the damages, but I'm still, it's still, you, you messed up. All right, let's look at another one. Name dropping. Derek, I was wondering if you could help Alan and I, of course, Steve, I'm absolutely able to help you and Alan. Thanks, Derek said Alan. <laughs> right. So this is the thing in, uh, narratives you go, uh, okay. I approached uh, Derek working at his station. His attention, oh, uh, his uh, his hands uh, move through the desk. Fill uh, okay. His his filthy hands. It's grimy. His filthy hands move. Through, uh, his filthy hands move along the wood, cutting through the cutting. Uh, moved along the wood as it cut. Here's the machine cut to size. Okay, uh, I approached Derek. Uh, I approached Derek working at his station. Okay. His filthy hands. Uh, okay. Because this is in first person. He hadn't noticed me approaching uh, over the sound of the machine cutting the wood to size. All right. Do, do, do. Just me approaching. Uh, I paused at the sight of his filthy hands wiping across, uh, wiping on, wiping across his sweaty, his forehead, cleaning, drying it of sweat. Um, uh, he did. Okay. He, uh, he jilted to attention. Uh, notice um, he jilted to attention when he noticed my presence. Okay. Hey. I was wondering if you could help Alan and I, right? So we know this is going to be I, whoever I is, right? Okay. Boop. I approached Derek working at a station. He had to notice me approaching. Uh, okay. 
I approached Derek working at a station. He hadn't noticed me coming. Heading over. Heading heading toward him. Over the sound of the machine cut in the wood to size. I paused at the, at the sight of his filthy hands wiping across his forehead. Uh, drying, drying it of sweat and leaving a stain of black behind. Okay. Soot behind. Uh, uh, oil, uh, grease, soot behind. He jolted to attention when he noticed my presence. He noticed, he noticed me waiting for him. Okay. I was wondering if you could help Alan and I. Alright. Thought of, uh, Placed the cut wood over into a, uh, a pile. A pile of organized plywood. Uh, four by fours. Four! Is it four by four? I think I just four by fours. Of course. Of course, Steve. Of course. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Help, uh, help you too. Uh, just give me, give me a minute to finish these three pieces. Uh, uh, okay, right. So we already know his name is Derek, so we don't need to know that. And we know that Alan exists. Uh, oh wait, his, his name wouldn't be Alan; it'd be Steve. All right, thanks. Uh, said uh, Steve said. Okay. Well, actually, because it's first person, he goes, "I said." All right, so then you could be like, "No problem, no problem, Steve." Okay, so now now you've created a, an idea where you don't need to say all the names all the time because I approached Derek working on a station. He hadn't noticed me heading toward him over the sound of the machine cutting the wood to size. I paused at the side of his filthy hands, wiping across his forehead, uh, drying it of sweat and leaving a stain of grease soot. I don't think I could just say soot. Cause sometimes when you're doing woodwork, if anyone's ever been a carpenter, sometimes you gotta adjust the uh, the blade. You gotta you know move stuff, and there's usually like uh, some, you get a little filthy. You get a little filthy. Uh, anyway, he jolted to attention when he noticed me waiting for him. I was wondering if you could help Alan and I. He placed the cut. He placed the cut wood. Uh, uh, he placed the cut wood over into yeah over into a pile of organized four by fours of course i'm happy to help you too just give me a minute to finish these three pieces thanks i said uh thanks much appreciated appreciate appreciated i can't spell for the life of me all right um i spell it right i guess i did did i i feel it yeah whatever no problem steve so now we learn who i is by the way we learn who I is. We know that he's Steve. But if you look at this, I used Derek, I used Alan, and I used Steve. Those are the three characters that are involved in the process of the scene that need to be acknowledged. And I spread it out enough where we have Derek in the beginning, so we don't have to hear his name again right now, just based on the, the presentation. And then Alan, so we know that that's the other character in the story. And then we learn who the person talking is, Steve. And there you go, name dropping as no longer needed, and it makes it fluid. Okay? All right. Final thoughts. Final thoughts! Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait. Eh. Okay, final thoughts. The power of refined dialogue. It's essential. Okay, because I said that. I don't know. It's essential to reflect on the transformative power of well-crafted dialogue and storytelling. Dialogue is not merely a tool for character interactions. It is an art form that can breathe life into your narrative, create depth in your characters, and immerse your readers in the world you've built. 
The mastery of dialogue is a journey and not a destination, and it requires continuous practice, observation, and refinement. Now, the impact di dialogue on storytelling is something you should think about in this sense. One, character depth and authenticity, because it's through the dialogue that characters become three-dimensional. They, uh, they reveal history, motivations, fears, and joys. Masterful dialogue allows characters to speak in unique voices, making them memorable and relatable to your characters, uh, to your readers. Number two, plot development and pacing. By using dialogue in a dynamic way, it becomes a tool to advance the plot. It can introduce conflict, build suspense, and provide resolution. Now, the pacing of your story can be effectively controlled through the rhythm and intensity of the dialogue. Thrace, subtext and theme exploration. Remember that subtext and dialogues enriches the narrative by adding layers of meaning. It invites readers to read between the lines and becomes engaging and more <clears throat> and deep. Uh, uh, it becomes engaging to the reader because they're thinking, they're emotionally getting involved in understanding and exploring the story through the dialogue. That is something they have to think about. Like it's subtextual. It isn't just like, let me tell you what it is. And for for world building and atmosphere, dialogue reflects the world in which your story is set. It can convey the culture, the era, and social norms. Um, if I were you, as as just a, a quick aside, uh, just like I did multiple times real quickly for you in these examples, you review and revise. So take a piece of your writing and review the dialogue critically. Get out the bias that you wrote it. And uh, use some, uh, you know, if you see it's uh, a chunk of dialogue like we did for the info dump, you say, how do I break this up? If it's unrealistic conversation, like we showed, work on it. And if it's extensive name dropping, do what I did. You just look at it. You go, how do I get these names in? But don't make it so obviously name dropping. Uh, and through this, you want to practice an experiment because Rewriting a scene doesn't make you a bad writer. It doesn't mean that what you wrote originally, you're a horrible writer and, oh, I have to edit. No, the first thing I write has to be perfect. No, great writing is rewriting. And it's okay to take a scene and rewrite that scene and experiment it because your goal in practicing is to be able to control the words you use. And that's going to take some time. Uh, and it's okay to go, I have this scene. Let me just kind of rewrite it and see where I could go with it. Let me just see what I could do, play with it. You know what? I'm going to make it more, more subtextual. Uh, I'm going to make it, I'm going to add a little bit more immersion into it. You know what? I'm going to take a, I'm going to see if I could build the character's personalities and have someone read it and tell me uh, if they can tell who's speaking, right? Like little things like that is just great for practice in general, you know? Uh, you also want to be, uh, you want to observe your uh, surrounding and the people you speak with how they speak, their body language, um, things that uh, you found interesting, okay? But more importantly, seek feedback. Write what you write, let people read it, and they'll tell you. They'll be like, I didn't understand this. I did understand this. Oh, this person's speaking. Uh, you could be like, well, what do you think they're talking about? Right? Those are always good, too. Okay. Next video in the series. So uh, this is interesting. So this is video number 10. This is the final video in the series for now. This is video 10. Uh, I will be reorganizing my lessons. Yes, I will. Yes, I will. I'll be adding new playlists and adding to older playlists periodically. I want to expand the Right Mindset YouTube channel to include more specific playlists. Um, so I'm going to start kind of like moving things around a little bit uh, in a good way, though. You know, I'm going to continue to build on some of the playlists, but where uh, I was on rotation for some of my I got the 10 videos per playlist as I wanted for the original 10 playlists. And uh, this is now a time to start going. Let's expand and let's play around. Question. If this is your first video within the playlist series or you've watched a bunch of them, let me know if you liked the series and would want more of these videos specifically. And uh, if you haven't done so already and been watching for quite some time, uh, please subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss out. All right. And as always, 
uh, keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Okay, bye. I love you.